thank you very much for inviting me to contribute a talk to this series, this amazing series. I got a chance to look at some of the videos and was quite impressed with what I saw. I hope I'm going to be able to meet the bar. So a bit about myself. I'm uh, Edina Nyong. I'm an uh, assistant prof at Johns Hopkins in the Department of Applied Math and Statistics. And uh, I'm going to basically talk about a concept or a problem in graph theory that basically captured my imagination for quite some time. It's going to be an introductory talk and I've arranged to make it accessible to, to the math club audience. So what I'll be talking about today is the Kotzig Ringel Rosa conjecture. I would typically uh, basically abbreviate this as the KKR or the KRR. Conjecture. All right. So at the end, I'm going to say a few words about uh, the conjecture why it's so fascinating. But I think. Independently of the applications, the statement itself is very appealing and very intuitive. Um, that's the reason why it's very popular. Okay, so uh, before I jump into the statement, there are a few things that I want to define. I'm going to stress that although the problem comes from graph theory, the approach I'm going to describe is going to be very different. It's going to be based on studying functions. And at the end, I'm going to say a few words about uh, the graph theoretical problem which motivated this conjecture. So, this work that I'm going to discuss is based, apart, based on three papers. The first is a joint paper with Isaac Wallace from Iowa State. We met in a GRWC. This is a graduate workshop in combinatorics. I highly recommend it. It occurs every summer. We discuss problems in combinatorics and basically try to work on them as groups. Um, it's based on another paper which proposes uh, an approach for attacking the conjecture and I hope to make a video proving the composition demo, which I'll discuss later. And finally, on a third paper, which is an ongoing project with uh, Antoine Clark. Okay, so uh, how do we set up the stage for the the KKR conjecture. So first of all, I'm going to be working with integers. So uh, let Zn denote the set of numbers 0, 1, all the way up to n minus 1. So every time that I write Zn, I'm really talking about integers starting from 0 all the way up to n minus 1. Okay, so there are n numbers because I start from zero. Okay. For any set, for any subset S, it could be as large as Zn itself. So let me write this. For any S in Zn, S in Zn, uh, f of S. and a function a function f uh, that goes from let's say zn to zn also noted f belongs to zn to the power zn this, these are two equivalent ways of describing a function uh, that takes as input elements from Zn and output elements from Zn. Okay, so um, 
So if you give me any subset S of Zn and a function f that goes from Zn to Zn, so let me put this part in parentheses, then f of S denotes the subset of all the images. So f of i, where i is in, in s. i is in s. Okay, so this is here. i is in s. So when I write f of s, I really mean the image of all the elements in s. That's a first notation convention. All right. Another notation convention that we're going to make is that uh, if I write f in parenthesis 0, I'm not referring to partial derivatives here. This is basically how many times you compose a function f with itself. And if you compose a function 0 time with itself, then this is going to be the identity function. It comes out to be i for all i in z i. So this means that if you take a function f and you compose it with itself a zero time, you get the identity function. So f of i comes out to be i. And uh, we're going to take f subscript k to be f composed with fk. So this, I want this k plus 1. Let me put here fk plus 1. Plus one. That's okay. So this is just to describe the composition. All right. So I think at this point, we have everything we need to state the so-called KRR conjecture. Conjecture. Uh, I think I'm going to need something else, so sorry. We need something else for the KR conjecture. I need to tell you what the symmetric group is. So let. So here we're done. I'm going to say let SN. So this is a subset of all the functions in Zn to the power Zn. Denote. Denote the largest subset of bijective functions in Zn to the power Zn. And this is also called symmetric group. Symmetric group. So I'm really talking about permutation. SN is really the set of all permutations uh, you can apply. So if you give me a sequence of integers 0, 1, all the way up to n minus 1. If you think about these as jerseys on people's back, then SN describes all the ways you can reorder these n jerseys. So there's n factorial uh, permutation, and each one of them can be seen as describing a bijection from Zn to Zn. Okay, so now I really think we have everything we need to state the KRR conjecture. So KRR. Let me write here. The KRR, the Kotzig Ringel Rosa conjecture, conjecture asserts that for all f in zn to the power zn. Okay, 
for all f uh, subject to such that if I compose f n minus 1 time, so I compose f with itself once, twice, n minus 1 time, um, and I do this for the whole domain Zn, if the size of the image is equal to 1, and I will give an example of what this means, then, then the maximum maximum over sigma in Sn of the size of the following set sigma f of i minus sigma of i for all i in Zn and now Close the definition of the set. This maximum is equal to n. This is a wonderful, beautiful statement of the so-called ARR conjecture. So let's make sure we parse this because we're going to spend quite a bit of time thinking about uh, what this means, what this buys us, and at the end I'll say a few words about what motivated this wonderful conjecture. So the ARR conjecture is a statement can be formulated as a statement about very special functions. These are functions which have the property that if you compose uh, f with itself n minus 1 time over the whole domain, you get a single a single thing. I will illustrate what this means in an example in a second. And here, basically, what I'm doing is uh, making a statement about an optimization function. We compute the absolute value difference, and we allow to change this sigma over all bijections. And in fact, what this does is basically a relay plane. And then we're saying that we want this, the number of distinct absolute differences to be as large as possible. And here the maximum you can possibly obtain is n. So it takes a few seconds to get used to what this statement means and what it packs into. And we're basically going to try to illustrate what it means by illustrating a few examples. Okay, so first of all, let's understand what this means. What is the statement here uh, talking about? So to depict these functions, so let's take an example. example. I want an example of a function which has this property. So I'm going to pick, for the purposes of my example, n is equal to 4. Okay, so if I pick n is equal to 4, then z4 is going to be the set made of 0, 1, 2, and 3. 4 is not included because the set has exactly 4 elements, we're starting from 0. Okay, so uh, let me take the following function. I'm going to take the following function f is a function in z4 to the power z4. Okay, so here's my function. Uh, define such that, such that, and here's a function that I choose. I, I, I want this property to be true, so let me pick uh, one function for which the property is true. So I'm going to say, let me pick f of 0 to be equal to 0. That's my choice for the example I want to pick. Okay, let me pick f of uh, 1 to be equal to 0 as well. Let me pick f of 2 to be equal to 1. And finally, let me pick f of 3 to be equal to 2. So here is a function I, I, I specified. The function is completely specified because I told you what the outputs are for every input in our domain. One convenient way of describing these functions is to describe them as a graph, graph theory. Uh, so I'm going to describe it as a graph. And the way I describe it as a graph is to, to put, first of all, all the vertices 
The vertices are going to be elements of my domain. So zero is an element of the domain. I'm going to put a vertex for zero. One is also an element of the domain, so I'll put a vertex for one. Two is an element of the domain. I'm going to put a vertex for two. And three is an element of the domain. I'm going to put a vertex for three. Okay. Now, this is just describing my domain. How do I actually encode the function? To encode the function, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw an edge which starts from the input and goes to the output. So for instance, f of 0 equals 0 is going to correspond to a loop edge that points at 0. Where you point to is completely determined by the so-called function. So f of 0 is 0. That's what this edge describes. All right. Uh, next, f of 1 is 0. So there's going to be an edge which starts at 1. That's the input and goes to towards 0. So here's the edge which corresponds to f of 1. All right? We do the same thing for 2. f of 2, there's going to be the edge that starts at 2 and goes towards 1. So f of 2 is 1. There's going to be an edge that starts at 2 and points towards 1. Finally, we're left with f of 3. f of 3 starts at 3. The edge starts at 3 and points toward 2. Here's our edge. At this point, we've accounted for all possible inputs of the function. We've described the graph, and this graph we're going to call a GF, the graph of f. So this is different from the x and y coordinate graph that we use in calculus. And in graph theory, we call such a graph a functional directed graph because it describes a function. And the only requirement that you need for a function, a graph to be functional is that every vertex has exactly one outgoing edge. Okay. Now, how do we know that this function that we describe satisfies this property? To find out whether the function satisfies this property, we're going to look at compositions of this function. So this is GF. Okay. So let's look at what happens if we, we ask, what is F composed with itself twice? What is that function going to look like? So the function composed with itself twice at 0 is still going to be 0. Okay. The function composed with itself twice at 1 is still, is here going to be 0 as well. And composed twice, what, what do I really mean? So if you compose f with itself once you go to 0, if you compose f a second time, you stay at 0. So f composed with uh, 1 here is going to be 0. Okay. Uh, twice is going to be 0. What about f composed with itself twice at 2? f composed with itself twice is here at 2 is going to be 1. And f composed with itself, f composed with itself twice is going to be, uh, sorry, let's, let's correct this, first typo, f composed with itself twice at 2, 2 goes 1, 1 goes to 0, so f composed with itself twice at 2 is going to be 0. Sorry, f composed with itself twice at 3, 3 goes to 2, 2 goes to 1, so it's going to be 1. Alright, so if we compose this function twice, uh, we get a new graph. Let's draw what this graph looks like. So. I'm going to put the vertices again, 0, 1, 2, and 3. We said that 0 goes at 0 for f2, 1 goes to 0 for f2 as well. So far it looks very similar to what we had before. Now 2 is going to 0, so 2 now has this edge. And 3 goes to 1, so 3 has this edge. So we see that the function now has changed, so this is g f2. The function has changed. It's no longer the same function. And finally, 
to verify that this statement holds, let me compute f3, right? n minus 1 in our case is 3. So if I look at f composed with itself 3 times, here's what I get. f composed with itself 3 times at 0 is going to be 0. f composed with itself 3 times at 1 is going to be 0. f composed with itself 3 times at 2 is going to be 0. And finally, f composed with itself 3 times at 3 is also going to be 0. So we see that the function always ends up at 0. The drawing of this function is very easy. Uh, let's draw the function. So you get 0, 1, 2, 3. So there's a self loop at 0 because f3 of 0 is 0. There's 1 goes to 0, 2 goes to 0, and 3 goes to 0. And so this is your 3. So the condition here is a statement about the fact that if you compose the function n minus 1 times with itself, you get a function like this, which we call a star, which has a graph like this, which is a star, which means the function every Every vertex points to a center vector, vertex. Okay, all right. So let me erase the board and continue on with the discussion.